Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Technology can reshape the way that we see the world. I probably first came to understand something of that reading through uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, a great work by Neil Postman. Uh, I think the subtitle is something like uh, Public Discourse in the Age of Television. And basically, he, he talked about a culture shifting from an image based culture. I'm sorry, from a word-based culture to an image-based culture and what that means. But it's not just television. Uh, I would. There's another book I read, uh, The Birth of the Modern by Paul Johnson, who's a, who was a Roman Catholic uh, historian and an outstanding writer. And The Birth of the Modern actually starts out with an extended uh, discussion of the invention of macadam, Macadam is uh, a, again, a, a style of paving uh, that radically changed the world, just like the Roman roads radically changed the world in their era. So technology can do that. And one of the technologies that's changed the world is the telegraph. Because what the telegraph did was it made it possible for information to travel for the first time in the history of the world to travel faster than a person could carry it up until the invention of the telegraph any information that had to go from one place to another could only go as fast as the person carrying that information but that changed and what that changed was in in a way it kind of shrunk the world, made it a small world after all. Because prior to, again, the age of the telegraph, if you found out about, if you lived in in Kansas City and you found out about a fire, a massive fire in New York City, by the time you found out about it, it was old news in New York. If you found out about a, a great earthquake in Peking, then the buildings would have already been rebuilt by the time you found out about it. But now you could get information about what was happening now somewhere else. And out of that came the idea of news. Never consider that prior to the invention of the printing press, there really is no news mechanism, and even the printing press, again, only would deliver local news because that, you know, the time it took for the information to travel. Well, all of this is just to remind us that uh, we're living in a different world. And the theme for, or the title for this particular uh, segment today is about the news. It's called Happy News Year because we have had a news year like no other news year that I can remember. This has been mind-boggling to me. We have had in 2020 uh, an impeachment. We've had a COVID-19, a ep- epidemic that caused... Uh, and it continues to cause great havoc on people's lives, killing hundreds of thousands of people in this country and millions across the globe. We have had riots in our streets with people being killed. We've had sections of cities barricaded off and declaring independence from the rest of the city and the state and the country. Strange days, are they not? 
I mean, we're just dizzy and, and we're sort of like, you know, one of those marathon runners who, who, you know, has got 20 yards to go, but can barely keep moving and is on their knees and dragging themselves to get to that finish line. That's where we are trying to get out of 2020. But of course, there's no reason. Oh, I forgot to mention the fact that we have a dispute about who won the election. Well, there's no reason to believe that when 2021 comes in just a day or two, that any of these strange things are going to go away. They may get stranger still. Who knows? But this whole vaccine thing, this rushed, hurried vaccine. And tension between vaxxers and anti-vaxxers, all sorts of things uh, still on the horizon. And the uh, inauguration of Joe Biden. Who, who knows what's coming? Jesus does. And friends, the reason Jesus knows what's coming is not because he looks into his crystal ball and he can see the future before it happens. It's not a omniscience that flows out of the capacity to look down the corridor of time. No, friends, the reason Jesus knows what's going to happen is because he wrote the story. What we're living through, friends, are your days and my days that were numbered before we were even born. You know, uh, we have... Uh, weather apps on our phones. And if you're like me, you check the weather. If you're like me and you like snow, you check the weather, especially at wintertime. If you're like me and you like snow, you check it around Christmas time. And Lisa and I both fit in that category. And so we're always looking, checking, is it going to snow? Is it going to snow? What's it say? What are the chances? But they're never... They're not always right, are they? When Jesus enters a new day, he doesn't wake up because he never sleeps, but when he enters a new day, he doesn't have to wonder what's going to happen. He doesn't have to check his forecast. He has to check the story. Of course, he doesn't have to check the story because he's omniscient. He knows the story from beginning to end. And so again, I don't know if there's going to be riots in the streets. I don't know if there's going to be tanks in the streets. I don't know if there's going to be a coup. I have no idea. I think it likely that there's going to be an orderly transition of power. I could be wrong, but I think that's the most likely thing to have happen. But what I know is the one who actually has the power. I'm tired. I know you're tired too. We're all tired. This is not easy. Uh, you know, we, we all crave uh, stability. And we haven't had it this year. And we don't necessarily have a prospect of it coming anytime soon. Back to normal isn't even a question we're asking anymore. We're forgetting what normal was. And all I can do in the midst of that weariness is rest in Christ. All I can do when doing my best to peek into the future and seeing what looks like not saying it's here yet, but what looks like increasingly uh, harsh treatment of Christians, an increasing sort of command from our secular leaders that we affirm our loyalty to them, I 
whatever's coming. I want to be ready for it. And the way I want to be ready for it is by doing and feeling and thinking what I know I'm supposed to do and feel and think. And that wraps or is, is all wrapped up in my confidence in the reign of Christ. Jesus says to his disciples, they're going to, they're going to come after you. They're going to separate you. They're going to kill you. They're going to kill you thinking they're serving God. Now, I want you to know, Jesus says, I told you this so that you would not be afraid. Be of good cheer. For I have already overcome the world. Those of you who, like Lisa and I, have mowed your way through the Queen's Gambit may grasp this illustration a little bit more clearly. You know, as you're watching those games, if if you're like me, you don't know enough about chess to really know what's happening on the board. And so you got to follow other cues about what who's winning, who's losing, how badly is it going, should we be afraid? I mean, maybe if someone loses their queen, you realize, that's not good. And you wait and you wait and you wait and you hope that your hero wins and your hero wins. Well, I want you to picture Jesus and the world playing chess against each other. Jesus and the devil playing chess against each other. Jesus and your own flesh playing chess against each other. Because Jesus knows all things. Because he is God in the flesh. We know he's going to win. But what we forget is that every move made by his opponent is the move that he ordained from before all time. Whatever Joe Biden does will be what Jesus ordained. Whatever Donald Trump does, it'll be what Jesus ordained. Whatever happens with COVID or the vaccine or the conspiracy theories or the riots in the streets, it'll be what Jesus ordained. We don't need to worry about that. What we need to worry about is submitting to his revealed will. Submitting to his prescriptive will, that will by which he gives us his commands and what he commands us is to be of good cheer. Because he's already overcome the world. Happy News Year. We come now in our ongoing series, The Bible in Five Minutes, to the Song of Solomon. And you might expect that Uh, I might find myself uh, blushing if you could see my face, Uh, but I think I can avoid the blushing. And I want to start uh, unpacking this book, this celebration of marital love by talking about the glory of marital love. And I want to do it by recounting a conversation uh, that I once had with Uh, one of the premier uh, producers in the Christian music world uh, who also uh, has recorded a number of uh, albums himself. His name is Charlie Peacock. And if you're at all familiar with the music scene in the Christian world, you would be quite familiar with that name and some outside the Christian music scene. In fact, uh, I heard it on good authority from someone who was there that uh, one time not many years ago, uh, when U2 was still touring, uh, that they, during their concert in Nashville, actually gave a shout out uh, to Charlie as if he wasn't so cool already. Uh, Well, Charlie and I had a conversation on the phone some years ago, and I let him know how much I appreciated uh, his album, Kiss Me Like, excuse me, the album's called Love Life, and it included a song called Kiss Me Like a Woman. And what I said to him was this. I said, Charlie, 
you know, you, you know that uh, one could argue that the uh, opening anthem of the whole Christian rock music scene was Why Does the Devil Have All the Good Music? Uh, I want to tell you how much I appreciate the fact that you, as a Christian, uh, were willing and able to so powerfully communicate the blessing of the marital act as a marital act, that we have a, a great wide world uh, steeped in immoral sexuality, and here you uh, sing this glorious ode to moral sexuality. Uh, and he mentioned to me that there were many Christian bookstores, which used to be a thing, and was back then. There were many Christian bookstores that not only shipped uh, back that album when it released, but shipped back all of his albums. It was quite a controversy uh, among those who would say, well, yes, there's nothing wrong with marital love. In fact, marital love is a good thing, uh, but it is a private thing, and it's not something that should be uh, sung about. Well, uh, marital love is not so private that God didn't determine to give us a book of the Bible that celebrates it. There are those in the history of the church who, again, driven by a uh, Gnostic uh, view of the marital act, have offered the uh, argument that the book of Song of Solomon is uh, an allegory about God's love for his people and not, in fact, a celebration of marital love. And as the little girl on the meme says, I want to say, why not both? Uh, in fact, I would argue that the gift of marital love uh, is a sign of God's tender love for us. So I want to suggest that it actually is both of those things, that it is probably principally and first uh, an ode to marital love. Uh, whether it is a song written to Solomon, whether it's a song written by Solomon, uh, I don't know who the original, you know, there's dispute about who actually wrote this. But what I do know is there's a great deal of conversation here about uh, not only the, the joy and the delight of when a husband and a wife come together, uh, but the wisdom and the appropriateness of waiting until husband and wife are husband and wife, that we're not to awaken love before it's time. And even how that uh, posture of waiting actually creates deeper blessing in that marital sexual relationship. Now, I, I, I don't... You know, it's not uh, a read that is uh, pornographic. It's not purient, uh, but it is clear and it is direct and it is God honoring. So let me encourage you to, to if you haven't, give this uh, book some attention and to labor carefully and diligently uh, to embrace a biblical view of marital love that you would push against both uh, the permissiveness that we find in the world that says anything goes, but also uh, that part of the church which attempting to push against that wicked permissiveness uh, can carry with it a uh, unbiblical and unhealthy uh, skepticism about the blessing. Embrace the blessing and embrace your spouse. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.